chop, 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 chop. Wagwa me people. Up and running like how the sun up and burning. Yeah, people. Yo, what go on in the night, yeah? I don't know what go on in the night, yeah? Cutting it style go on in the night, yeah, people. <laughs> what go on in the good? Yeah, me now on different location in the house, you know, so. You don't know the thing going on, man. I want love. And we're there. We're there, you see me? So, people, I don't know if you do already. Like, share, and subscribe because you don't know record this in a real time. So, we just upload this 3 o'clock in the morning. So, make sure you like, share, and subscribe. I don't know how we got to work already, people. Big up on yourself. I want love. You understand? Yeah, man. You understand? Yeah, man. So, just like share, share to your grandmother, your grandfather, the kids in your yard. Yeah, man. Local and abroad. You know the thing, go. Mad thing. Up. Oh. Warm. No rain today. May I tell you? You know, it's so no rain today. I saw about cross the ocean over in Florida there. Yeah, too much rain. <laughs> too much rain. But we there with you. I hope you can see me until 2 o'clock. Yeah. When them have the last emancipation day celebration, they're going to shock when you hear. When, when, when you hear the interview, we are going to, you're going to be very shocked. Yes, yeah. no more. You know, it seems as if there's a whole heap of Donald Trump about the place where a rise up against the Asian, but not only Asian, black people in general, because we hear him say, the foreigner, the, the people, them are pies in the blood of the American. The white people might talk, them say the people, them genes, make them intrinsically a murderer. Them say the murderer is of our genes. And it might related to the Asian, them, and the people, them, who decide them about the port. And if you think there's only people who undocumented them about the port. Them all over the place. Come on, Mali, we're going to take a break and come forward. Yeah, Mali, thank you, Lord. I tell you, I will have a combination about the place now, you know. Yeah. Will you parties are going to the studio with a will parties and come out with some nice music. I swear for God. Yeah, man. The singer them I go on with that thing. We like it. We like all the singer them I go on, you know, but we need more of the we need more of the singing. And more the instrument them. Yeah, we need bully more the instrument them. We see, say, Dean Fraser, I make a headway right now. We love it. We love how Dean Fraser blow down the place. Yes, Dean. We love where you're going with, man. Yes. They had them at 10.30 with a serious, serious thing where we're going right now in the Dominican Republic. I don't know how much one hear about it in the Dominican Republic. But the same thing where Donald Trump bring down Panish and them in a in a Dominican Republic, it's even worse. Can you say Dominican Republic and Haiti the pan two piece, same piece of land? But one of them are Spanish and one of them are English. Sorry, sorry, not English or French, you know. And not even French, you know, you know, the Asian them create them own Creole. Whole thing like how we create our own Jamaican language, but a very, very serious thing. I don't know how it will go because we see Jamaica down there, we see America down there, we see Kenyan down there. And I hear the minister a foreign affairs should be, she has said enough money not there to sustain where them hope for sustain in IT. You know, see, the money I run out and America I'm going to put a certain amount. So I don't know where we are doing there. Jamaica me at talk about. So we're going to come forward with it. Yes, we're going to come forward. Tell you about this development we are going on in the Dominican Republic where the leader of the country decides say he must go send back all of the Asian them back to IT and them start out with them say the non-documented in other words if you if you're not legal in the country they must send you home but guess what in other country there them give you a certain amount of time for stay with your with your visa 
maybe like a month. And after the month, you have to go renew your visa. The thing is that you have to travel from one part of the island to the next part of the island to renew the visa. And sometimes when you go there, it's a full up that, you know, get you. So obviously your visa expired, so them now declare you not documented, so you have to go leave. I them go run out, them are run out. And I can't to the, the man them, you know, listen to them as now. Them are run out 10,000 Asian per week out of Dominican Republic. 10,000. Now, them are do that. If you think say them are do that, listen, when Trump say he might go, if he become president, he might go remove not only <laughs> not only documented immigrants, you know, but everybody will have the genes where I'm saying I'm not, I'm not, I'm not contaminate the American white wife. I see you singing. Know? So me I tell you no, I'll no jump here can we up there. And I go out like so all right, you know. When you better praise the chop now with because the whole other road come back here. Yeah. Listen to this. Decrying the international community's slowness in restoring security to Haiti, a government spokesperson for the President of the Dominican Republic announced plans to immediately begin deporting 10,000 undocumented migrants per week. This operation aims to reduce the excessive migrant population detected in Dominican communities. And it will be carried out under strict protocols that ensure respect for the human rights and dignity of the repatriated. The decision will concern thousands of Haitian migrants who have sought safety across the border from the extreme gang violence and poverty that has overwhelmed their country. The Dominican government also says it intends to step up border surveillance and control by deploying more staff and specialised equipment, including cameras and drones. According to the country's president, Louis Sabinader, the decision is justified. He believes the UN-backed Kenya-led multinational security mission is not enough to reduce the number of people heading to his country. This is why we have warned the United Nations. Either they and all the countries that have committed themselves to helping aid will act responsibly there, or we will act responsibly in the Dominican Republic. These actions have already begun today and will continue. The Dominican Republic already has a strict stance on migration. Since coming into power in 2020, Abinader has stepped up the number of deportations of illegal immigrants and increased police presence at the border. A 164-kilometre wall has also been built and is due to be extended even further, and more than 200,000 undocumented Haitians were forcibly returned to Haiti last year, according to the UN's International Organisation for Migration a number that could now double. Yes, you hear it. I don't know how the, the minister talking to the UN. And I never, I don't know, I, don't, I mean, I never I listen to the whole of what she has said. I will want to know if she didn't mention anything about that and the problems with the Asian them are going to have. Uh, it's having with the Dominican leadership, 10,000 per week. 10,000 per week. It's a serious, serious thing. And we hear Donald Trump echo the same sentiments. Him say, he going to deport everybody who undocumented, but him go further than where that man has said. He might go for, he might, he might, he might, he might say, they might come in our country with them bad genes. Bad genes, he call it. So like some Nazi kind of argument. You know, the eugenics people, them, where they talk about black people is at the lowest level of intelligence. Yeah, them say black people at the lowest level of intelligence. So now them are sure you know say for them country which are not for them own because them teeth it them teeth it them come from Europe and teeth it 
And white people have to fight against white people to claim it. Yes. And kill the whole heap of the Indian them, the Native American them. And now we see now, them attack. First, them attack the Asian them. But as me I say, if the man never win, trust me, he going to make America white again. <laughs> you think a joke. He going to make America white again. That is him aim. Too much niggas. Too much people. Colored people. Black people. People who talk language, let him do it, understand. And that's what I say, And his wife is an immigrant, you know. She come from, be up in Europe there. Yeah. As a matter of fact, most American right now, I want to know if he might go, he might go, go deport the press secretary for the, pre, the president. Is a Haitian. She come from Haiti. You know, and I don't know, why it, it kind of stay away. <laughs> it kind of stay away. Trust me. Symposium. You know, every year at Keep, up at university, we have the man who's always pushing it and spearing it, Dr. Michael Barnett. Good night. Yes, speaking smoother, young man. Yeah, my oil one. Yes, man. Good, 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 you know. Yeah, okay. So, here we come again, the symposium. Yeah. The rally could run up or we're going to happen this year? Well, this year, and we're celebrating the 81st strong of Peter Tosh, you know. It's entitled Undisputed Re Revolutionary and Social Advocate, you know, which I think encapsulates Peter. And we have Copeland Forbes, former manager for Peter Tosh. You know, he'll be presenting um on a, a his presentation is entitled Reggae Malitis, Reggae My Life Is, setting the record straight, which is really based off um his writings on Tosh from his book, you know, Reggae My Life Is, which you know him him, him published a couple of years ago. And opening remarks will be coming from Clyde McKenzie, who is the co 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 writer for, for the book. He 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 helped Copeland put that book together. Um, then we have Alan Skill Cole, who is the first manager of the Whalers. A lot of people don't know that, you know, Alan was managing the Whalers from in the 60s. That's Bob, you know, Peter and Bonnie. And and so we tend to just associate him with Bob, but he he he, he also had a relationship with with Peter and Bonnie, and he he, he still kept contact with Peter when they all went on their solo careers. So. He, he has something to say about Tosh, you know, his perspective. And his, his talk is entitled, My Life with Peter, A Personal Reflection. And then we have Niambi Tosh, the youngest daughter, or the youngest child of Peter Tosh, who is, not, who is the director of the Peter Tosh Foundation. And she will be talking on the topic of championing the legacy of Peter, you know. And then we have some cultural performances by Fred Lux, uh, Asante Amen, and History Man. Mm. Just to kind of keep the vibes flowing, you know? All right, so which part is the Wait, wait, wait. This is the on the Undercraft at UA campus on October 16th. That's next week, Wednesday, from 6 to 9 p.m. That's the Undercraft at UA Wednesday, Mona Wednesday. campus. Wednesday. Yeah, man, it's a week from today. Yeah. Um, 6 to 9, I just want to let the people know, say, you know, for try get there for six so then catch the whole program, you know, and allow for traffic because why the traffic rough them time. Yeah. Well, I tell you come up there. Yeah, they may come up there and I tell you man. Rough yes, come man. up and go long too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And the admission is free as well, you know? Yeah, all right. Is, so yeah, yeah. Yeah, people yeah. look out for that and you'll be yeah. that symposium. Yeah, yeah. that's and coming the Wednesday. Yeah all man, right. that's part of the Peter Tash celebration for the ATF. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, ma'am. Give thanks, Bridget. I read. Yeah. Most get a big up, but we're going to big up, you know. We're going to big up, you know, because cutting edge, cutting edge and stepping razor for the first time we're going to broadcast in front of a live audience in a Philadelphia. Yeah. 
We are going there, Philadelphia, with the cutting edge and the step and razor, broadcasting in front of a live audience. So I uh, big up the Philadelphia, Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. Big up the Jamaican and Caribbean and African community, Trinidad and Tobago, Barbados, Haiti, Antigua, St. Vincent, Grenada, St. Martin, Senegal, Nigeria, South Africa, Liberia. Oh, I'm below the crew of 52nd Street, the Deuce, Rising Sun, Woodland Avenue, Broad Street, 5th Street, Alney and 5th Street, Shelton Avenue, West Oak Lane. <laughs> That's what you say. If the man them not hear it, you know, they might go back. You know, they look at Mount Erie. West Philly, North East Philly, hey. The place where we're going to do it, can't hold so much people, you know, Rasta. North East Philly, Cast Avenue. Yes, who are big up, hyperactive sound, NEC Black, Small, and Hype and the crew. Okay, can't say whatever, big up, you know. Yes, I, all right. So you want to know. Yeah, we're going to have Philadelphia with the cutting edge and the stepping razor. Live, yes, in our hall. So we want all of you in the surrounding areas, in our Philadelphia, be there, you know, say, long as the center of activities between the Republican and them and the Democrat, because them say that state there, that state there, if you win that state there, more than likely you win the election. So the two parties, them have spent millions of dollars down there to see who can trump up that electoral college sum of 271st. And I can't do it, look, you know, it kind of even, Stephen. Well, I don't understand this election thing, you know. How is it that this man does so much things and him just... Lie and just do all sort of lying on him something there. And him still neck and neck with Kamala. I don't know how, I don't know what is it. I mean, she reached far considering that she just start years, just the other day, but trust me, man. The man have some people there where it's like him like, well, them say, my Jesus still. I hear holy for them. They might interview them, say, Jesus. Jesus come back. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, I tell you, America, only oh, that serious problem, trust me, only oh, that serious problem. We have to go forward with the music. Continue, I tune there, trust me. <laughs> Man, I have some serious political statement to make for the music, them, and we love it. Yeah, brethren, we love it. So, we're supposed to interview this sister and a very serious thing, very serious thing she bring to she bring it to my attention and I read I read where she write and I said, Well, I have to go make the Jamaican people hear this. Given you know last week, I went no last week, Sunday. We are listening to Cabo and this the same thing come up about this. In the what them call it emancipendence. Couple weeks ago, me I talk about it, and me I say, I will come up with them foolish, you say. But I, I, I find out this who, <laughs> I find out this who come up with the foolishness. But it's a very serious thing with these so-called people, them who control Jamaica, money bag, interest, business, and all that. Most of them is not African descendants. Most of them. They might decide now to move. We no move, but make this the week the way you have Emancipation Day and, and Independence Day be a commercial venture. A commercial venture. Just like how they make Christmas become a commercial venture when you have nothing to do with Jesus. As a matter of fact, it was a commercial venture originally. Now they must say the days in between. You could have moved it and put the two of them together that it you no. Know, you don't lose no business. My argument, and I assure Cabo say, Cabo, look at Christmas and New Year's. 
have almost the same amount of day in between. And I know you're nobody at all. So why you not just move Christmas and put it with New Year's and just have the whole thing as a commercial venture? Because the, 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 the so-called business or sector, they might deal with money in the pocket. They might deal with the, this effect, the historical, psychological, and spiritual effect of why emancipation is so important to African people. Because you can go move a holiday where the Jews have. And say, boy, make you work with some commercial activities. Or if you put the two of them together, a, a, a joke business, a joke. It's a joke business. After we fight, we put it back on the calendar. Who remember Jalide? Anybody who remember Jalide? Them young people are too young to remember Jalide and Maconin. Yes. When 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 we are march all in a race course, the man they all burn down the, the Queen Elizabeth plant tree where she <laughs> the man they burn down Queen Elizabeth uh, plant where she plant in a, in a what them call it now. Them call it Eros Park. And we are we, we demonstrate, we demonstrate right now. Uh, um, a PG partisan arrested will get the praise for put back that holiday, put back that day upon the calendar. Yes, but it was very important and significant. We don't know some man who do have a clue about emancipation there, why or when, why it is important to we as African people and African people who come from that bloodline of so-called people who was enslaved and fight for them liberation and we reach this stage and now and some guys who was part of the part of the slave master picked them them ancestors come from that same slave master i come tell you now say we must merge the two dear them so as not to Make it affect the working days. Joke business. Joke business. Anyway, so as we say that now, we have a sister here. She named Desiree Batiste. She's a researcher on colonialism and transatlantic slavery. Writer, person specializing in British shuttle enslavement and colonialism. Playwright, literary critic at the TLS. London, England. Hey, we want to say hello. Give time. Good night, ma'am. Hi, good evening. I know, say, never know, say, so quick out I want you, don't it? <laughs> <laughs> good evening. How I, are I, you? I, I, I read, I, I read, I read the thing, you know, I read it. Yes, great, great. Yeah, I'm man, I, I read it and I, 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 I said, no, you have to come on the, the program in the night, yeah, because we're going to do my program tomorrow. You. All right. So well, now, thank you. All right. Tell the people them what you was telling me on, the, on, on my phone. Tell the people them exactly what you was telling me. Yes. Okay. Well, good evening, everyone. And first of all, I hope everyone in Jamaica is well in light of the hurricane that passed in North America. I know you all are close geographically. Um, so the story um, is about the Emancipation Jubilee event that took place in July 31st recently. This is an annual event in Seville to yeah. honor the enslaved ancestors. Yeah. And um, as a person from Trinidad, I consider that to be um, an event that honors all of our collective Caribbean ancestors. Um, and, a, a, and the story is that the two New Zealand women who came and presented an apology in person, um, apologized for their ancestors' role in enslaving Africans in Jamaica uh, on the Argyle Estates, and they then mentioned one ancestor of African heritage who was a housekeeper in the Malcolm family, and they said that they wanted to honor this ancestor going forward, honor her memory. And it has turned out now that this ancestor was herself an enslaver, and not just an enslaver, but somebody who benefited when slavery ended 
and was paid compensation to the tune of forty thousand pounds in today's. All right, well, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, stick up in, stick up in. You are saying that the people them who was honoring the so, supposed to be slave was a slave master themselves. That's what you're saying. Yes, a slave owner. That is correct. Slave owner, and yes. And so, yeah. So the Jamaican, the, the, the people them who are responsible for the, for the, 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 bring them here and make them do this thing. They didn't know that. Well, it doesn't seem like anyone knew that. And um, that's part of the problem. And I think that part of the problem is this easy access suddenly that we in the Caribbean are giving to these enslaver descendants that just come and want to give an apology, which is um, not a bad thing. The intention is probably coming from a good place. But I don't understand, and many people don't understand, how they came so quickly into being put on the stage at what is a <laughs> sacred event. And that we are said too, because I see a whole heap of people, and I say, you know, say, I don't really want to interview them people, eh, but I couldn't get to go interview them because I didn't love interview them, you know, and I don't know what happened after that because now that them gone, you know anything, what happened after that? Well, Did we they don't give know a reparation? No after. reparation money, no nothing. No reparations money. So, you know, to look closely at this one case, I think is really important. Um, this is not a situation of, you know, berating the Caribbean reparations movement, which is a great cause and is making great progress, becoming more famous and talked about. And, um, and that's a great thing. But I just think that we also need to critique what is happening as a people. We need to keep our eyes open. And I think it's very symbolic that this apology took place at night, around midnight, when most people in Jamaica were asleep. Because <laughs> it could only happen when a country is sleeping. Yes. Well, maybe it never take midnight for them to sleep. Because I come like, most of we are asleep right through. You know, we get, we get, look like we get drugged out. By these <laughs> nice talk and pretty talk and you know, oh some white people come here for come apologize and have them something there. It's amazing. You know, we, it we, is we amazing. Love, yeah. We love to see that you know, we love to see that you know when white people come own up to certain things, yet still you know that is just words. You know, four hundred years, five hundred of words, you know. So what you think should happen now? What you think should happen? Now that you have brought well, it I to the attention. Well, I've written an article. It was published by a Caribbean network based in Florida, Caribbean National Weekly. Um, I think it would be great maybe if the local um, press in Jamaica might report on it because I think it is important. Um, but I think it's a little bit of a bigger picture, you know, about what is already happening. Because first of all, the two women who came to Jamaica did not just come to give an apology as it was reported. It was reported that it was this big gesture. They came all the way from New Zealand because they felt such a, a need, a heartfelt need to make this yeah. apology to the people of Jamaica. But in fact, we were also filming a documentary while we were in Jamaica. Oh, yeah. Okay? So this is what they're doing. They're making a film. So what we're talking about here is interested atonement. That's something that we need to scrutinize and we need to be talking about. Yes, yes, yes. So, so oh, you know. they started to make the, you know, the, how far they reach with that picture that they're making? Uh, it's a progress. So, obviously, they managed to film scenes that they did while they were in Jamaica. Um, you know, so they found uh, a clip of a New Zealand newspaper called Star, which people can look at online if they're interested. Mm. And you see a clip that Maddie Hog Island is talking about uh, a famous rebellion that happened there. Uh, you know anything about the Jacks family that is in Barbados? They, we went to Barbados to apologize. Right. The Jacks family. You know? Yeah, so the family, last name is Malcolm. And, um, you know, there's a lot of things about this apology that need scrutiny. So it's not just the, the big um, omission of the fact that the African descended ancestor was an enslaver. But there are other things to look at. You know, for example... They apologize on behalf of Clan Malcolm of Scotland. Clan Malcolm is five generations 
of very wealthy Scottish lairds, as they call it, which is like the word for lord. None of those five lairds are their ancestors. They oh. are descended from two peripheral members of Clan Malcolm. But yet they have apologized for Clan Malcolm and without any involvement of the actual family in Scotland today, which is a family that exists today who have had no part in what they went to Jamaica to do. So who are they really speaking for? I don't know. I don't so there's know that. I'll... But there's a documentary in the making and, um, you know, Jamaica is being used. Um And they're going forward and, you know, like I said, self-interested atonement. I just find uh, it extraordinary that this is happening. Yeah, um, I don't think you heard me the first time, but you, have a, you know, you have many arguments about the Jacks family. From, uh, you have yeah, Jacks all in Jamaica. And they, they went to, I think it's Barbados they went to the other day to atone also. Yeah. I don't know if you have any information about that. Um, well, the Drax family actually is one of the families that's standing their ground and they will not engage. So the Drax family is one that uh, the Barbados government has tried to um, approach and engage with to discuss reparations and they are ignoring it. And the current um, family representative in England is a very wealthy man. He was an MP until recently. And at the time he was an MP, he was believed to be the richest MP in the House of Parliament. Um, the family still owns the original plantation site in Barbados with the original house built in the 1600s. Yeah. Um, nothing is happening in that direction. And Jacks Hall is still named after the Jacks family. We're yeah, still in great houses. Yeah. The, yeah. Still yeah. After so, them. so you have these, you have these families. Um, you know, there is a group of families that have come together and formed a, an organization called the Heirs of Slavery. Which, let's start with that name, for example. Many people are saying, "Why are they calling themselves the Heirs of, Heirs slavery, of slavery?" And when yeah. they are the heirs of enslavers. Yeah. So there's that. <laughs> Wow. But they have an organization and some of them have made apologies in relation to the countries in the Caribbean where they had uh, ancestral involvement in enslavement. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's not all terrible news. You know, these people have a contribution to make. Some of them are powerful in the media. Yes, they can influence. Course. But Others, yeah. we still have to scrutinize and, and critique it. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's of my course. view anyway. Yeah, no, I agree um, with you. I agree with you. I agree with you. You know, we have um, also the, 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 the lead of uh, the Prime Minister of Alan Dutch, the Dutch Prime Minister, who had apologized also. Yeah. That was a big yeah, thing when he apologized. Yes, yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's a big thing. And I think, you know, one of the issues that's really interesting is why it's justified in, in the Caribbean among the reparations leaders uh, engaging with these uh, white um, enslaver descendant families is because they seem to believe that these families are going to help pressure the British government into apologizing and paying reparations. So that's the strategy. Uh, and maybe that's a good strategy. But at the same time, you know, I think we, we can't be asleep. We cannot be sleeping as a yeah. people. And you cannot have people come to Jamaica and spin a yarn, tell some version of their history, and then it turns out to not even be accurate. Or yeah. at least it's not completely accurate and it's a distortion and I just think we deserve better and and I think we need to be mindful of our ancestors you know you cannot have a commemorative event like the jubilee at the emancipation jubilee and have people go up on stage and say they want to honor an ancestor who it turns out it was an enslaver mm -hmm. yes sister I'm so, really glad that I'll ask you to say it for yourself rather than I saying it for you you know Um, so what is, also, your next, you know, what is your next, what is your next, um, what, what you're doing now as a writer? Well, as a writer, right yeah. now I am working on a, I'm working on a book about um, the reparations movement. So um, that is happening with a Caribbean publisher and, and that's quite a wonderful thing. And um, it's exploring some of these issues where the reparations movement is today. And uh, it does explore some of the issues around the white um, enslaver descendant families. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's focusing on, on one particular enslaver descendant family. I won't say which one, but um, it's a very interesting 
exploration of, yeah. let's say, it's a it's exploration of the backstory of one of these uh, enslaver families. Um, and then there are other things. Um, you know, I have a play that's circulating around the UK. It's called Incidents in the Life of an Anglican Slave. And it's based around a real document from the archive, a 300-year-old letter written mm. by an enslaved individual to the okay. archbishop. Okay. Um, oh, yeah, I have to say something, Muta, so if I may. I want to say something about the Church of England, okay? Because this is important in relation to what we're talking about. Um, the, there, there was more than one apology that night at the uh, Civil Emancipation Jubilee, and one of one of them came from the Church of England. It was a recording of the Archbishop of yes, Canterbury, yes, yes. so-called apologizing. Um, but what I found striking is that he said the Church sinned. That was his explanation for the Church of England's involvement in slavery. It was a sin. Um, slavery was a crime against humanity. Yeah. And I don't understand how Jamaica, the Jamaican government, has accepted all of these apologies on behalf of the Jamaican people. I would love to know how they came to accept these apologies on behalf of the Jamaican people when these apologies uh, stop short, really, of fully acknowledging True apologies. You know, the criminal yeah. responsibility. Yes, yes. You know, yes. How, how could we accept an apology where the Archbishop of Canterbury said, at a sermon in Jamaica, he gave it on the 21st of July, yeah. on a Sunday. He said the church sinned. I don't understand that. <laughs> okay? So, you know, I, I really don't understand it. You know, hundreds of years of involvement in the enslavement of Africans, including owning enslaved people in Barbados, where people but, were tortured, branded. Yeah, the, the, the That's problem not is that the Anglican church, they have always been sinning. <laughs> The Anglican Church well, is yes, a sinner true. church. <laughs> so I don't know because they actually start a whole heap of these madness that take place with Henry VIII. Henry VIII to kill out his wife and his wife and farm the Anglican Church from the Roman Catholic Church, you know. So, uh, yeah, they're, they're full of sin. But anyway, yes. we, we give thanks. We give thanks for your contribution. And I don't know. So we meet already, but I don't remember. So... You have to pardon me that. I don't remember meeting you, but... You yeah, me. we met just briefly in Jamaica at a poetry event at the Edna Manley um, Center at Mona. Okay. And it was... Um, you were honoring Mervyn Morris, so that was a really nice um, nice thing. Um, and you gave a nice speech. So I do... I, I remember that. I wonder if it's the art um, school and not the university you're talking about. At the art school. Um, It might be. It's the it art school, be, man. Um, it's the art school. There was an in Mervyn Mars at the, the, the Edna Manley Art School. school. Y yes, that's it. And um, it was honoring Mervyn Morris, and you gave a wonderful speech. And then you stopped at one point, and you recognized that uh, Rupert Lewis was in the audience, and you stopped, and you gave him some some, some deep and heartfelt thanks for his, uh, um, his role uh, in your early career uh, 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 and in your first publication. Yeah. Um, so yes, that was that was evening. I remember it. Right. Um, you know, but how do how do people in Jamaica feel about these issues? You know, you, you know, want to talk to a lot of people. No, I talk about it, but people, if you don't if you don't bring it to them attention, it just passes. You know, it just fly past. But it's not something where most Jamaican interested in. I mean, them go at that ceremony, but the ceremony just a night out for a lot of people. You know, yeah. with a with a with a cup and the chocolate tea and, you know, the gospel singing and the, you know, that is just a little thing for them. It's not something where people go home and think pan and figure it out. Yeah, Unless we are like, bring it up, you know, it's just an underground thing, you know. So I hope this will also help to bring it on top still. We give thanks. Anyway, give thanks, sister. Well, thank you so much, Mutter, for having me on your show. And yeah. uh, it's great talking to you. Yeah, man. Harry, Harry. Okay, that's Harry. Was Des <laughs> that was Desiree Baptiste. Research on colonialism and transatlantic slavery, right at socialist, socializing in British shuttling enslavement and colonialism. Yes. The pieces and a very interesting conversation that a while ago. Because ignorance, may I tell you, ignorance is a serious thing. And that is how they control us. 
Yeah, they control us with some symbol, some recognition of themselves, even though they're not here. That's why we always talk about the, the importance of symbols and how symbols is used to maintain presence of the colonial masters in the minds of the people. Symbols is there to make you feel that it is offering something, but it is really there to control your consciousness, maintaining an idea and a belief. Like when you say a statue, a statue represents the most important part of your understanding of who or what you are supposed to look up to. That is why the white Jesus is so important to your mind. Because even if you don't see it, even if you don't see a picture of that white Jesus, when you close your eyes or when you pray, no matter how you say you're conscious, when you project your mind to deep space and search for an image, that image come out to be the picture that is on the wall. Serious thing. That picture is part of your consciousness and it portrays something that they know it will continue to be a part of your understanding of them, not of you. Because when you pray, you're supposed to pray internally. So they caught you internally by giving you something external. And even if they move it, it's still indelible in your subconscious. And you pray to that image. We come with the image get a leak. Because that is what is manipulating the mind of most African people around here. Images, symbols. Like when them have you wear a cross around your neck. That is a symbol of their supremacy. Because in Israel, the cross is an emblem of what would I like how you call a, a rope, a lynching rope, or a guillotine, or an electric chair. The cross is that. And they have you wearing it around your neck. Of something of symbol that your the image that they put on the wall become a crucifixion around your neck. As if it was a Electric chair, would you put an electric chair around your neck? If then they tell you, say, that image died on an electric chair. This is the cutting edge. We're going to take a break and come to the now head. Even though we now see this something and it helps to influence how we think, how we feel, and where we do. And it was placed there, not by you, but by people who control you to our levels because sometimes we say we're free and really what is freedom because look at a simple little thing like a stoplight a stoplight they don't control human beings behavior upon the road when them drive or ride nobody is there to tell you go or come the other time in Jamaica, when you have a policeman stand up in the middle of the road with a big gloves on him hand. And sometimes I'm in a little shelter in the middle of the road. And they are direct the, the four lane at four different east, north, west, and south with the traffic. Now, them don't have no police in the middle of the road that way again. Where them have some light, red, gold, and green light, where they decide your movement and even if you can't read the lights is a symbol of what you must do 
when you see certain light illuminate on the, the post where it depends. And everybody know what the red mean. Everybody know what the yellow mean. And everybody know what the green mean. And even if you drive and are you wind up on the road, are you wind up on the road, the light still on there to control you. Some people go through the light. Some people, even if they don't see nobody, stop at the light when it's a red. Some people, if when them see red, them still go through. Some people get away with it when them go through. Some people get lick up when them see the other when, when them never see the other car come from the other side. And some people hear a siren behind them when them see the red and don't stop. And it always imprinting on your mind. Next time, anytime you see the red, you go and make an effort to stop. Some people it's too late for them when them go through the green. It's too late. When the, the other man will come from the other side, lick him when them go through the red. Very important that we understand how the mind function as it relates to symbols and what symbols have to do with how we govern ourselves in this part of the world. Yeah. People do things based upon what they understand about a specific thing. Living are just inanimate. Because most of the things them where we give credence to is not living things, it's inanimate objects. Like when you say, when you go up on the highway and you see a triangle, like an isosceles triangle, pan a red, pan a yellow um, what, um, poster, I don't post that. <laughs> Them show you say, it's a steep hill you enter. You enter a steep hill. You see the isosceles triangle. Watch it. Sometimes they put a little thing there. You see stone a roll. You say, watch it. Stone go down roll. Come down there. So you can't read, you know. But you see the sign. And the sign make you know what is ahead. Even if it's down there. there. And it make you subconsciously and subliminally a prepare for something that might not be there. That is a form of control. Them show you say you must travel 80 kilometers per hour. And every every kilometer you go, you see the sign mark 80 kilometers. And you choose to press the gas because you don't see nobody on the road. But you see the symbol, you see the sign say 80 kilometers. And when you press the gas and go over to 90 kilometers, you see some man come out of a bush along the road with them uniform and them have one something a hole in front of you. You say, you have to stop and them say, look here, you need to go 90 pan 80 mile and 80 kilometers. It's one. And you can't tell them, say, I lie to them, I tell. Even if the machine never work. <laughs> Even if the machine never work, when they hold it in front of you, you can't say, no, because you never look on the speedometer. Most people don't drive and I look on them speedometer. Unless they might expect something. And what you expect is in your head that is projected by the person or the people them who put that there to make it come in your head. Say, you know, say, the, the sign say 80 kilometers. I was ease up half of the brakes, you know. And I was ease up half of the, the, sorry, the speedometer, the speed, the gas. I was ease up half of it. And there goes your freedom. Because you ease up half of it and you're not go below the 80. And when them hold up them thing in front of you, they realize, oh, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm not, I'm not so fast. 
Some of them machines are not work. I tell you that some of them machines are not working. It is just there to control you. That is what they have to do. And if you look around you every day, every day, whether in your house or out of road, whether in a building, in a church, even in a prison, there are certain things that them use to control you without human beings actively. I tell you this and I tell you that. And I would say most of the things them that you give credence to, that you obey or disobey, is not human beings. It's there to cause you to disobey or obey it. But it's those symbols that them put in front of you that is very effective in how your mind operates. When you go to church, symbols is all over the place. Symbols is all over the place when you go to church. The flag is a symbol. It represents a whole country. And the color that is on the flag or the style that is on the flag. A serious thing. We continue the journey, you know. We're gonna play this. We're gonna play this. Listen. Have you ever seen a black boy whose IQ score is more than a physicist like Albert Einstein? A black girl who can speak 10 different languages? Or a black boy who started speaking in full sentences at the age of only six months? Well, let's know about the 10 most genius black kids. Number 10, Romani Wilfred. If Einstein and Stephen Hawking had a genius competition, guess who would win? That's right, Romani Wilfred. This kid has an IQ of 162, two points higher than both Einstein and Hawking. Imagine being able to read and write fluently before the age of three. By 10, Romani decided to casually score higher than some of the greatest minds ever on the IQ test. Number nine, Anala Beavers. What were you doing at four months old? Probably babbling, right? Well, Anala Beavers was reciting her ABCs. And by the age of four, not only was she reading, but also speaking Spanish fluently. Her IQ was 145, and she became a member of Mensa at the age of four. If anyone deserves their own reality show, it's her. Imagine watching a toddler solve puzzles while casually discussing world events in multiple languages. Number eight, Alana George. Alana George is another kid who makes the rest of us feel like we might have been a bit lazy growing up. At the age of four, she had an IQ of 140 and could solve 50-piece puzzles faster than most adults could brew their morning coffee. She became the second youngest member of Mensa in the UK, showing that her intelligence is truly out of this world. Number seven, David Belogan. David Belogan didn't just graduate from high school at age nine. He did it all remotely on his iPad. Let that sink in. This budding astrophysicist is already developing theories that challenge the Big Bang Theory, and he's got plans to explore the mysteries of black holes. In his spare time, he's inventing concepts like hologram computers, Basically, David is out here breaking scientific ground while the rest of us are just trying to figure out how to use our smartphones. Number six, Kelvin Doe. In Sierra Leone, Kelvin Doe built a radio station at 15 using nothing but scraps. Think about it. Most kids that age are trying to figure out how to make a sandwich, and Kelvin's out here creating media platforms. His invention brought communication to his community and got him an invitation to speak at MIT. Number five. Mabu Loiseau. Mabu is fluent in eight languages and a master of eight musical instruments at the age of five. This multilingual prodigy speaks French, Spanish, Mandarin, Arabic, and more, all while playing the piano, violin, and guitar. Number four, Carson Huey. At just 14, Carson Huey was earning a master's degree in quantum physics. Most of us can't even say quantum mechanics without getting tongue-tied, and Carson's out here researching it. He's been fascinated with math since age three and is already on the path to a PhD in physics. If the world needs a new theoretical physicist to crack the mysteries of the universe, Carson is the one to watch. Number three, Elena Annelly. At 13, Elena Annelly is not just attending medical school. She's also the founder of Brown Stem Girl, 
a nonprofit organization that empowers girls of color in STEM fields. Imagine juggling medical school with running an organization. She became the youngest African-American medical student ever, proving that she's not just smart, she's a trailblazer for future generations. Number two, Caleb Anderson. Most kids learn how to read at age five, but Caleb Anderson was reading by the age of one. By three, he was already tackling advanced math, and by 12, he was being recruited by Georgia Tech. Caleb's brain is like a supercomputer, processing information at lightning speed. He's on a fast track to becoming one of the youngest college students in history, leaving the rest of us wondering how he does it. Number one, Adam Kirby. At just six months old, Adam Kirby was speaking in full sentences, and by age two, he had an IQ of 141. Most toddlers are still figuring out how to walk, but Adam was solving puzzles and reading books. This pint-sized genius took the world by storm with his high mental development at such a tender age, leaving psychologists stunned and his parents thrilled. Here's a quick question. Isn't it true that the mainstream media never tells about black genius children to keep them unknown? Tell them you heard it first on the cutting edge. Where is our drive show and drive rasta? Drive business I work with. Okay. Here we go. Here we go. Let's say you lived in the deepest forest, never came across the Bible, and you just live in your life every day. And you die. Are you going to go to hell? Because the, the, the Bible and the Quran and these books only take effect when you know they're around and then you believe them. Up until that point, they don't exist to you. So you're the one that's governing yourself with whatever you're doing. So you're the first God, first of all. Oil in your backyard, it's government property. But if they find drugs, it's yours. I stop. <laughs> Uh, it's uh, a serious thing. <laughs> what do you go a while ago? What do you hear the, do you hear the person say a while ago? What do you hear the person really say? I'm going to play it again. You know? It makes very interesting. Just think about it. Just think about what the person say a while ago. Listen. Why is it that if the government finds diamonds or oil in your backyard, it's government property? But if they find drugs, it's yours? I stop. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, you ever think about that yet? Say, if the government find gold and diamond and oil by your property, it's for them all. But if they find drugs by your property, ganja, plant, or so, and your own, and they charge your feet. <laughs> Uh, I said, that's so funny, man. That's so funny. That could have played continuously. <laughs> uh, I said, I'll be a plate, I'll be a laugh, but it's less. It's kind of so much with you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. I'll just say, I'll take some phone call. Meanwhile, we play this. Come lock off your radio and talk to me. See, they know. Joke business, man. Joke business. Lock off the radio and talk to me, man. I'll never lock you up. Joke business. Joke business. Total joke. You! You're in the moment. Yes, yeah. Good night. Good night. Okay. Um, that's not so a quick thing. Um, you notice, you realize that Prime Minister thing just died on just sudden death, so you know you know more talk about it. So you saw the people them good now. After them, bring up the distraction of Prime House where distract them come with to get you the emancipation. Or you for come have your private sector people them want to get you the emancipation when I see them. Four parents, slave our four parents, and then bed, and I talk, oh, one wow, get you that. You see, you saw, you see, level of destruction. But yeah, that's not yeah. the one. 
Them never say, I'm going to get you guys, you know. Them say, they want to call the holiday in between so long. They want to fuse it with Independence Day that you can have more commercial activity without break it. But that, may I just try to share the mood that them are guys that are interested in the betterment of black people. No, money. Them, money them are money them are working. Money them are working. So what do you want to do with Boxing Day? Eh? What do you want to do with Boxing Day? Christmas. But, but what really amazed me about Muta, to the mail is to the news, and murder about five young men from Pomo will get locked up because they are them are robbed the bank. Then. When I put up my word, them are robbed the bank. But what really amazed me, the police read them out and find material and laptop. Question mm-hmm. now, them not getting a bail until the 21st of November. But up until this very minute now, I don't hear more co- even go look for the Prime Minister and ask how he do. Go look for the Prime Minister? Where am I look for the <laughs> Prime Minister for? I even going to ask him a few questions about... No, but they're going to go court with it. They're going to go court with it. Say, so, the reason being, what the reason why I'm going to go court, say? Um, go trash out. Where they're trash out? Or, uh, say, you mean, make um, the, the thing that um, leave it alone or uh, have less I don't know where they might go a code for, but I know where they might go a code. I don't know. No, yeah, so why they, uh, where they're not going to look for the, the the prime minister? Yeah. But I say them can't trash out nothing just secretly, so they might have to go a court with it because I quote but it in, there. But the impression I get that in my court, say, are uh, the, the, the interior commission, say, something like stand down or. Mm. Yeah, that's right. They might go to court. They might go to court. But more time, I see him one, the company TV and I big up the CJ and Ara. Um, establish them. Yeah, oh. but it's a baby Trump thing, you know. You know when Trump, when Trump lose, you know, him say that thing rig, you know. And when him, when him win, him say, see there, him win. Him Don't win. make him lose, you know. Any time him lose. Something wrong, something go wrong. It's either somebody rig it or something. something so, I, yes, you know, we they check but it. Just be a job. See him first, I tell you, say, him dead as to get you the corruption. corruption. Yeah. But, but, but that's why I tell you, I'm out You see, until black Jamaican people realize that none of them two parts here, none of them, not the mm-hmm. private sector. Because I see the, the private sector them come like some of them down here, you know, or all of them down here, you know, where I collect extortion. And not one of them, I don't know of a private sector that build a high school or a training center for you. Now, none of them down here where I collect extortion, build a training center where you say, yeah, a John Brown build that and you youth can go to our life because study and learn something. You understand? If, if the Korean father them just probably donate to one, two, three million. You understand? And not for them a people come from what Syria and Lebanese, you know, and them come here and just get rich overnight. And I don't see Maxwell Avenue a better place to live. I don't see Rima a better place to live. The day they have go down to Maxwell Avenue. I mean, I say, but that place uh, is a place where it gets worse, uh, Family living a rich family. Everywhere down there, so get worse. Everywhere. And Not then, the say, and all that for them there. people, there. and what really amazing on Muta is that the man is just coming at politics and just so comfortable and so rotten and rich and low. We can't get the formula and find the formula. But I don't know. It's it evidence that the law really did it for the poor people. Them. As I mean, right, I can tell a guy, say, no, man. Now look for more kind of body I come to. Just get some ghetto man who has scam as I tell a motor. It was yeah. some ghetto man a scam. I said I had police a jump out a helicopter. <laughs> to surround them out. I had police a jump out. And one marine with a, then I both for patrol to see course to start yeah. the gun from coming. But one the sea your sea course lack like when I might want to do this in the stuff. But oh, until that well. people realize that and uh, we have to get this thing together. No Mark Golden, no Andrew Golden, yeah. no Derek for we because of 
have them with motor. I don't know where I run I go as a black man. When a white boy comes to clear my throat. And yeah. them can't run up because them I carry them wealth with them. I can't see so them coming up for us so poor. So poor motor and so right now it's one man a more must say half a cent of us. And the people yeah. say the same way. I, I meet the Jamaican people till no blood now in our way and still I mean it quick. And them yeah, swap election and you see the people in my room come with them. But this and that same way. Motor. Not not change for them. Me, me, me don't know motor. But no matter program what camp in a motor, eh? Jamaica National Service Corps. Just like how we talk about the COVID money, would I like somebody add the Jamaica National Service Corps and the COVID money and them so who are benefit from it? Motor. Mm. Long life, my brother. Yeah. All right, bless but you. That's time for them, man. Long life. I'm big up to that's part of school. Respect All right, sir. Give time. Yes, may I tell you, I can tell you, I can't play it before the, 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 the way name let's start. They add them. Here we go. 30. We was in slavery in 1830. Uh, Church, uh, Yuri, what year did that Baptist religion garbage start? 1608. We was in slavery in 1608. <laughs> Yuri, when did the Mormon religion start? 1830. We was in slavery in 1830. Yuri, when did that damn Jehovah, what is that? Seventh day disadvantage start? 1863. We we was just being emancipated, okay? When he still was whipping our backs. Couldn't read, couldn't write. And when did the damn Jehovah Witness start? 1872. We was under Jim Crow and black codes. Come on. And that next one, the Pentecost, when that start? 1901. We was under Jim Crow laws. So what the hell are you Christians talking about? None of these religions pertain to our people. They hated us, despised us then, as they despise us now. Oh, you scared to death, Negroes. Just sit up. And that's to actively and aggressively stop Israel. Cutting ties, just cutting ties, isn't going to be enough at this point. You need to impose a no-fly zone over Gaza. Impose more sanctions against Israel than you uh, imposed against Russia. You need to demand immediate IAEA inspections of Israel's nuclear facilities. You need to revoke the American citizenship of every Israeli dual citizen and seize all Israeli assets in America and Europe. You need to take uh, Netanyahu to the ICC yourself. Join the South African case uh, at the ICJ. Ban Israeli media. Treat the Israeli flag the same way that you treat the swastika. Designate the IDF as a terrorist organization and Israel as a state sponsor of terrorism. And if that doesn't do the trick, then you need to launch a shock and awe campaign against Israel the same way that you did against Iraq, the same way you did against Libya and Afghanistan and so on, and bomb them back to the Stone Age, because that's what you do, isn't it? Isn't that supposed to be the American way? But we all know you'll never do that. And because we all know that you'll never do that, we all know that you have never meant a single word that you said. And that's why no one is ever going to listen to you again. The only thing that you can possibly do to salvage yourself is something that we all know that you will never do. So you've been found out. You've been exposed. Your cover has been blown. The audience for all your speeches about democracy and liberty and human rights are filing out of the building and we've turned off your microphone. Oh, you've passed the Rubicon of hypocrisy at this point. There's no going back now. The world is moving on, knowing what we know. And no matter how much you repeat your completely bankrupt narrative, you can't make us unknow what we know about you. America is a train wreck. They collided with a dumpster fire, and you're trying to put that fire out with oil and plutonium. And everyone wants to get as far away from you as possible. It's strange that you don't want me to call you the West. You don't want everyone to be lumped together under that term. It's not my term. It's your term. I didn't come up with it. You did. You call yourselves the West. Western civilization. We all grew up hearing about how wonderful the West is. Western achievement, Western thought, Western enlightenment. You're happy to take collective credit as the West for whatever you think is good. But for the bad things, you want to disassociate yourselves from it. When you're talking about the bad things, then you're like, well, what West are you talking about exactly? Who do you mean by the West? The way you people tell the story, people like uh, Douglas Murray or Jordan Peterson or Sam Harris or uh, Richard Dawkins or uh, Hitchens, Christopher Hitchens, all these types, you would think that every European on the continent participated in painting the Sistine Chapel, everyone painting in shifts. All of you collectively invented penicillin from the telephone to airplanes, from the, the cotton gin to the microchip. 
You all did that as one gigantic team effort. We, the West, uh, abolished slavery. We, the West, gave women the right to vote. We, the West, developed modern technology. You like being called the West then, but just bring up one, just one of your innumerable atrocities. And then everyone starts looking around. Who, who, me? Oh, you must have me mistaken for some other uh, person, some other West, Q, you know, Shaggy. It wasn't me. My forefathers didn't own slaves. My forefathers didn't slaughter the Native Americans. My forefathers were just poor, innocent peasants. I have nothing to do with it. Innocent as can be. You want to take collective credit, but you want to individualize a man who killed more people in a matter of seconds than anyone in the history of the human race. And not to mention every American president after Truman, you know, from the Korean War to Vietnam to the dirty wars in uh, Central and South America to Panama, the first and second wars in Iraq, Somalia, Afghanistan, Libya, Syria, and before Truman. I don't think that the United States has had a single decade in its history when it wasn't slaughtering some people somewhere in the world. These are all products of Western civilization, too. But anytime these crimes uh, get brought up, you deny collective responsibility. I mean, if I try to list all of your crimes, I can't even remember them all. But if I try to list just the ones that I can remember, your battery will die before I can even properly get started. You've got statues of Winston Churchill, who starved millions of Bengalis and who used poison gas on the Kurds. You not only don't condemn your terrorists, you not only don't try them for war crimes as they should be tried, you re-elect them into office. Not just elect them, re-elect them. And you deny any responsibility for their atrocities. No, if you want to be called the West, when it comes to any positive achievements, then you have to accept being called the West for all the full catalog of inhuman, vicious, uh, genocide, murder, rape, torture, bigotry, exploitation, oppression, assassinations, coups, and subjugation, evil and brutality, all that your people have ever committed. That's why I always say Western civilization is a sarcastic term because you never civilized. And, you know, we made cool stuff is not a defense. Your approach to morality is uh, let's not and say we did. Let's not be moral, but say we are. You think that righteousness is denying the evil you do, not stopping yourselves from doing the evil. As long as you say you don't do it or you call it something else, then somehow uh, you're not evil when you do evil as long as you don't admit it. It's upside down world. Mm -hmm. Every day is backwards day in the West. Bad is good, wrong is right. It's no surprise that you think that uh, a person should be called whatever pronoun they self-identify as, because that's what you've always believed. That's what you've always done. You self-identify as virtuous, as moral, as righteous, freedom-loving, tolerant people, even though you have never been that, and no one in the world sees you as that. But still, you insist that that's what we call you. You insist that we deal with you as if that's what you are. You always believe that the whole world uh, should participate in your self-delusion. So, of course, you came up with this idea that a man uh, should be called a woman and treated as a woman if he believes that that's what he is, or a woman a man. This isn't new with you. It's always been the way you believed. It's always been the way you functioned in the world that uh, you believe that you had the right to defy objective reality and that your own victims uh, had no right to define you. No matter what, you insist on your own blamelessness. And I'm telling you, how on earth do you expect to ever stop doing blameworthy things if you think that you are immune from blame, no matter what you do? Yes, okay, your forefathers were probably poor peasants. I agree with you. They didn't participate in the crimes of the West. They didn't participate in colonization or imperialism. But then they also have no reason to take pride in the achievements of the West either, and neither do you. They were victims of the West in their own way, and so are you. If you want to disassociate yourself from the crimes, then disassociate yourself from the achievements. 
and realize that you and your forefathers and your ancestors were all abandoned and betrayed and duped by propaganda about Western civilization. No one ever cared about your development or your forefathers' development. No one ever cared about your welfare or your forefathers' welfare. No one ever cared about your upliftment or theirs. No one ever cared about your life. Not yours, not your forefathers, not your ancestors. And the West doesn't care about you now. But here you are defending it. Like you have no self-esteem, like you have no pride. You and I both know the West doesn't care if you starve to death. They don't care if you get kicked out of your home and live on the streets. If you spend the rest of your life drowning in debt, they don't care. If you fry your brains on drugs, they don't care. And if you decide that life is too hard, they'll help you kill yourself. That's the West. And that's what the West thinks of you. The West didn't raise you right because you don't matter to the West. They don't care if you have knowledge. They don't care if you have an education. They'll pass you on up to the next grade, whether or not you can read or write because you don't matter. Every day of your life, your civilization all around you is shouting at you in a million different voices that you don't matter. You're just a replaceable cog in the machine. Everyone in the West is regarded as disposable by the West. And still you defend it as the pinnacle of human refinement. You need to break that spell because you're living in a trance, a trance of uh, propaganda that's all designed to keep you oblivious to your own humiliation. But then you'll get mad at me for trying to tell you to break that spell, to break that trance. You'll get mad at me because I'm trying to tell you that you need to stop being humiliated. You need to stop uh, aligning yourself with the, the, the ones who are humiliating you. You need to stop aligning yourself with the ones that were humiliating your forefathers and that are humiliating you now. And you're going to get mad at me. But you don't disassociate yourself. I'm supposed to disassociate you from them. But you're not. Why should I disassociate you from the West when you don't do it yourself? I'm trying to tell you that you need to break the trance. I'm trying to tell you that you need to break out of the propaganda. You need to break out of the indoctrination. You need to break out of the programming. But you're going to get mad at me for telling you that. And you want to hold on to the programming. You want to hold on to the indoctrination. And then while you're holding on to it, I'm supposed to separate you uh, from the indoctrination that you're, that you're holding on to. So how are you supposed to change? <laughs> At last to get there. <laughs> yeah, man. Um, the, the Labour government uh, with um, Keir Starmer in real disarray. A lot of um, resignations, the top um, advisor alike, mm -hmm. named Sue Gray, resigned because power struggle within in my administration, like say, she was a former civil servant who did do the exposure of the Boris Johnson lockdown parties when he was saying oh, people yeah, must yeah, keep yeah, away yeah. and thing. Yeah. And people in his party saying that she have too much power and that type of thing. And so she forced to resign, but she gonna have a next role for him for her representing me and other things and so, you know what I mean? Mm. And thing. And of course people are pressure him with how instead of him tax the rich, him 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 him, him want to take away the few, winter fuel allowance mm. for pensioners who do have pension credit, you know what I mean? Yeah. When 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 that has nothing to do with anything because in his case we am getting these freebies from this guy named Ali, millionaire, multi-millionaire guy named Ali, like free clothes and um, give him apartment to him son for two months to study for him GCSEs and all them kind of things. Eh? Him, him, you, you know, he's been showing the hypocrisy of that while trying to take away fuel allowance, winter fuel allowance, which the, the cold kills people, you know, especially the elderly, you yeah, know what yeah, I'm yeah, saying, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I, I watch, because it's not, it's none of his business, um, what pensioners have, each pensioner have, in terms of them bank account or whatever thing, pensioners supposed to get rights irrespective of what they have, because they have worked their lives, mm -hmm. 
mm. and paid into the system of and course. must get them rights and should not be um Penalized. deprived of yeah. them benefits. You know what I mean? See? I, I look like it's most of the capitalist country that might go on with them somewhere in a car. It, yes. Like America, I work with that too. Yes. You know, them, them talk the, 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 In other words, the rich get richer and the vast dead. majority of poor people to, to, to be poor. And, and this is, a, but Muta, this is the only way that they are richer and richer mm. by exploiting and robbing the majority of the population. Yeah. Because as you know, if, if if people were being paid proper and just wages, people wouldn't be in the problem, you know. It's a deliberate thing to underpay people and and as much as they, 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 they can, you know what I mean? Yeah. While they become richer and richer. Because as you know, without workers in, in, in anything, no society can function. Yeah. The wealth of a country rest on the the, 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 the the working of the workers, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Things do happen by themselves. If 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 all workers in every country, for example, go and strike, everything crash, you know. No matter yeah. how much billions these guys have, them them would have to them, them would have to just pack yeah. up shop, you know. Yeah. If people refuse to work, everything Grown to all, you know, but it's because enough people as workers don't see the power that they have if they exercise that type of unity. So in Jamaica, Britain, Canada, wherever, if workers come together and say, "Listen, if we don't get this, we stop work," those who exploiting them and thing and thing have to run away and disappear because the whole society would come to a stop. And that is why they always fight against workers working together in unity, in trade unions and that type of thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Yes, you know. Yeah. And yeah, and Saturday coming, you know, is the anniversary of when in 1992, Marcus Garvey Jr., our teacher, the Atkinson Technical, as the seventh president general of the his father's UNIE and ACL, decreed that every 12th of August must be commemorated as the genocide day um, for what has happened to African people in the biggest genocide in history, you know, with what Europeans did to us, yeah. Jews and Arabs, all three, and that reparations must be paid by all three because yeah. the 12th of October is the anniversary of when, as Marcus Garvey said, um, the boy Christopher Columbus from Genoa, Italy, invaded the Caribbean and l landed at the island of Guanani, which he renamed San Salvador. So, mm -hmm. same way other people have dear days when they remember what happened to them, we have our day, which he decreed to be the 12th of August. Yeah, you see, you see where I'm in a... In the Dominican Republic, where they might trace out the Asian them. They, they, they have always been doing that because no, it's a great republic, you know. 10,000 per week, they might trace, you know. 10,000 yes. of them per yes. week. Yeah. It's a racist republic, the Dominican Republic, yeah. that's always fought against the Africans in Haiti and, 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 and that type of thing. And, and what you have is the children of Asians who are born in the Dominican Republic are not given Dominican Republic citizenship, you know? No, 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 no. Yes. No. Yes, not given, not given Dominican Republic um, citizenship. This was why a few years ago when I saw that um, Andrew Wonis gave some Jamaican government honor to, to, the, to president the president of the Dominican yeah. Republic. I was very, very what angry. What a thing, man. What a thing. Because if you know history, Oh, can you be awarded in a racist republic president like that? Yes. I wonder, I wonder if them people they know history. Exactly. Them, them know anything about history and, yes. and politics. Because and when I saw Andrew one is to that say, you, you're awarded in a Jamaica government and a, to a racist uh, republic, racist president who, yeah. who, who, who kill 
and the poet Africans from Haiti. Well, they might they might extend it and now at ten thousand per week them say them I let go. Yeah. And them go back to Haiti. And you know Haiti stay there now. Pre -pre 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 Precisely, mm -hmm. you know. And 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 you know what is significant to the boy William Ruto in Kenya who sent police to Haiti to help the US and yeah. French imperialists for conquer Haiti and that type of thing. The amount of crime and homelessness in Kenya yeah. that is going on in Kenya. Kenya has one of the biggest um, slums in, in, in the world, right? Um, children are being stolen, kidnapped in Kenya and, 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 and killed, used for their body parts and that type of thing. Mm -hmm. But he has time to be sending Kenyan police to Haiti to work on behalf of the U.S. racists instead of sorting out the massive um, criminal okay. conditions okay. In, 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 in Kenya where people are suffering and that type of thing. That boy William Ruto is an evil neo-colonialist traitor man. Yeah. And this is why I applaud Traore in Burkina Faso and the others yeah. in, um, in, in Mali and Niger who have come together. You know, you see recently Traore in Burkina Faso was saying, why the African Union not taking steps to stop the killing and genocide in the, in, in, in the Congo? We are them killing our people for years upon years. The, 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 these U.S. and other companies, right? Because the Colton in the Congo, without it, mobile phones can't work and that type Some of thing. Some tell them and them something they can't work. Yes, and the, and the murder of our people in the Sudan too. Especially the Where children. The Arab militia, Janjaweed, meaning devils and horseback, yeah. murdering our African people in Darfur, in the Sudan, even though they are Muslims, you know. Yeah. Because of racism, wanting to exterminate our African race from our own continent there in the Sudan and elsewhere. Child slavery are going enough to. Yes, yes, never stop. As Marcus Garvey Jr. used to say, and Maria Tiena, and so, still going on mm -hmm. and killing Africans despite the fact that they are Muslims in the Sudan and that type of thing. Yeah, you know? Yeah. We have to move on all. Yes, and and one more thing. Um, on 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 Saturday to see um, commemoration of African Holocaust Day and thing. There's going to be a thing in Stratford at the Hibiscus Centre in East London where we're honouring people like Errol Dunkley, Jamaica's second child with Garden Star. I'll be playing there. Yes, man. Yeah, man. He's been here couple months, couple months and thing. You know. Okay. And I just did an interview with him the other day, a life story interview, which will be released soon. It's been filmed. I filmed it, you know, I'm in the editing stage. So, so any show go on up there now, which, which show go on in England, you know? Which artist up there? Artists, well, yesterday I was with the meditations, you know, Bridget, okay. um, Ansel, yeah. Critland, leader of the meditations. No, we may have the show. Which artist do have show? And, um... Yeah. And Winston passed away, but he has two others singing with him. They they will be doing a show in Brixton, you know. Okay, okay. And and also, at Linval Thompson and also Big Youth and Licorai. Oh, Big Youth up there now, too. Big Youth up there. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, yes. that one. Yeah, 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 yeah. We have yeah. a move. They will be doing a show in in Brixton at the um, Electric, you know. And yeah. things. So I was at rehearsal yesterday with um, Ansel Meditations and his two singers, and it went very well, you know what I mean? And and my reason about long time things. So as a man, we used to live in the Spanish town yeah. region from years ago in the 60s, and so, you know what I mean? All, and right. all right, so I give thanks, yeah? Yes, all right, so keep That's strong it. and Everything. kick them out of here, Timota. Keep on that yeah. platform, yeah. right? That's it. Good night, Mota. Good, Good night, man. Yes. Well, Mota, you saw the man them do a rasta over the years for them look for herb and thing and thing. And listen, you know, I want everyone to turn to the dictionary and look for the word cook and see what he tell you. 
right? Look in the dictionary, the word Coke, that's what it tell you. Coke mean they must sell Coke in Coca-Cola, you know. Right? And you see how much them disturb rust over the years of the herb. And so they know they turn on and teeth with herb from we. And I boast on my how many shipmen come out of the country. Right? Just turn on the dictionary to the back. Dictionary and the word coke answer the headline. Tell them what it means, tell them what coke means. Coca Cola soda, that means a long time. Yeah, a long time it's in there. What that you're talking about. Yeah, long time. So, you know, fine, say. No, but if you look at the dictionary, you're not going to say Coca Cola, you know, cocaine in a Coca Cola. Yeah, man. You have to think you ask about the meaning of coke. No, man, that's, that's what I say. Go to a dictionary, look for the word cook. Mm. We have a dictionary, I look for it, you know. Yeah, I don't say no look for it. I don't right. ask you because when you say look for what it means. Yeah. Okay, all right. And yeah. Coca Cola in that, uh, underneath the word cook as well. Cookie and Coca Cola. Coca -Cola. Yeah. Right. So you see what the man do to the world, though. So sometimes you wonder what the people, the man, this and that and that. Right? And a long time I use this word and I dominate the world, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Long time, right? of I, course. Yes, and you see it too. You so mm -hmm. much them crucify Rasta. So I, me, me, me run at the Rasta, I'm like, pop out of my head. Yeah. Get leaked. Go to jail. Yeah. I see they know. Well, I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. A long time I cook and I cook a cola, man. I don't, I don't know. Yes, but you know, a long time in the man. Yeah, but you see now, that's what I tell them. I turn to the dictionary, the dictionary, and see the things straight away to go on, you know. Okay. Yeah. I see two party teeth with herb, though. You understand? And you, them, you, them, in our country, we actually have them while they like that Rasta. Look at now. Look at now, man. On what sense are all right, since I don't know why something we fight, I don't know why I fight. So, you see, remember the man who oppressed you know, fourth parents, fifth parents, six parents, seven parents, eight parents of the line. Where are we black people if we turn upon them back here now? God, white, no, the, no, no white man, because there's no white man. The mongoose race, the Ardican peace rat. Right? See, in time is up now. Right, sir? Cassidy? Um, yes, we are going to Israel and now. Mm. Two countries are fired for Israel one time and now. Um, and and if, if America is being and go down for attack, it's going to be healthy Israel because everybody is going to fire for Israel because you are causing a problem now. When the war is going to the Middle East, is Israel gives America your space down there. Mm. Right? And so they did warn him, you know. So look here, Israel. Be careful. And you see today, dear, a man pump 180 missile per year, you can't think back one. So then the time is up. A time for America to win in power now. Because what happened now, I'm going to throw it under my hand in the you know, cards. I want all forces in Africa, all the, all the forces, the military forces. I want the whole of them to link up with me because they're afraid, afraid of that man. I know afraid of him. I want everybody to work with me. I'm not giving the military powers them. Because mm. I'm not afraid, afraid, of, afraid of them. Because you see what I know? Them run atrocity on the black race. Rich off of the black race. Sweat, blood, and tears. And today, the you want to come back for me? Not going to work. Not going to work, Mr. Mangoose race. All right, sir. Right, sir. Yeah, so the youth them. They never want them. Yeah, the youth them in, in, in Jamaica, me up here or no. You know, if you organize and fight against the oppressor who, who, who destroy your, your seven, me not about the fourth half your generation, the six, seven, eight, nine, ten up the line, what they have done. Mm -hmm. And that, if we organize and, and, and stick to, we actually have one another. We, we are idiots. Well, me, no, no, you know. Yeah, well, no. Have sense. I bet you right now, we say right now, 
black man say, right now, we have to take back revenge now. I bet you play that then he just run gang, run gang, gang, gang high. And when if you defend it, now we defend it. No, man, you make me shame, man. Come on, man. What will make you shame? Nobody now make you shame, man. Oh, yes. No, to, to all the youth, they might do something now. You go for your man, uh, Muta. One man you want, you're, 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 you're a six, seven man. Yeah. You see how idiot them there? Go, who you want, you go, who you want, you go, who you want. Yeah. I do not hurt innocent people. All right, come sir. on, come on, man, come on, look at now. Me no see Shwadu no a bad man, no, not all now, he's not a coward, you know. Right? Because you have me now. You see real bad man, Muta. You have to go wrap up now, you know, because of one minute time, you have little, less than a minute left, so talk quick. All right, you see, the real bad man now, it's called boy, she was all right. Meet me in the cemetery tonight, yeah. in the middle of the cemetery. Which side are you coming from? This man said me I come from the south side. This man said me I come from the east side. Right? Mm. So you have to know. You have to face the music. Yeah. Then you know, you come on now, boom, fire man. Bam, 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 bam. That's how they're idiot. Well, they know one day, so they run. I idiot. What do you have to do? Shoot and stand up? Then, hold on, no. Then, then it, that is no bad man. That is a coward. You can run. So where must so when them fire shot, they must stand up. Mucha. What? Look here now. You want to fire shot, you if know, you go for, fire well, if, you. if you go for go kill a man, you're gonna shoot him yeah. and stand up there. What do you mean to know? You want to fire shot for a man and no shot for fire for you? Yeah, of Joking course. Man. If you fire shot for a man, why you want to uh, shot for you? You have to run. Anyway, we have to move, no, we have to move. We have all to right, move. Yeah? yeah, all right, give thanks. Yes. Time signal time. Here we go. Listen, 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 listen. LGBTQ is the new birth control pill. Two men cannot reproduce. Two women cannot reproduce. And now they're even transgenderizing our children. They're manipulating and indoctrinating African children to undergo sexual surgery so they'll never be able to reproduce again. Dwayne Wade, whose son is now legally had his birth certificate changed. Mm. He's legally a girl. Yeah. Hormone therapy. When he gets 30 years old and looks in the mirror and says, you know what? I don't like living like this no more. I want to go back to being what God made me, a man. I want to get a wife and I want to have children. We only got one problem, don't we? Your reproductive is gone. Your testosterone levels are gone. Your ability to produce healthy seed is gone. There is no going back. It is birth control and racial extermination. Why do you think Kamala Harris is traveling throughout Africa? trying to convince African countries to legalize gay marriage. Why does America care how Africa chooses to run its society? Serious thing. Serious thing. Listen. Put 100 women and 10 men on a deserted island, and in 100 years, you'll have a thriving community of men, women, boys, and girls. Now put 100 trans women and 10 men on a deserted island. In 100 years, you will find the skeletons of 110 men. Let me break it down. In a world of confusion, ask yourself the critical question. If everyone was to live like this, will mankind continue to exist? If the answer is no, then this way of living is not suitable for mankind. It really is that simple. And don't let anyone fool you into thinking otherwise. I am okay. Yes, us. We are uh, live with a live audience right up there in Philadelphia. Next week, Wednesday and Thursday. Yes, out. Oh. Yeah, people, ma. Uh, big up for the silver, Zivi. You are going to man. You don't know, you know. He's a man I will get to where see him win. But here we go on, people, just do the right thing. Subscribe, like, cheer. So me I say, you man share it with your grandmother, your grandfather, your Z, yard and abroad, from the cat to the dog. You understand? You hear me, people? So you don't know one of them things, no man. You don't know when I catch you back tomorrow, you know? Yeah? We're going to be back here with the stepping razor.
Oh, so people, big up on yourself. You understand? Yeah, man. He's a man who catches him. You know, next one. You understand? Yeah, man. So just like, share, and subscribe, as we say. You see it? Yeah. You don't know how the thing goes. Share it to the cat, the dog. Yeah, man. From local to abroad. You understand? Yeah, my people. So, one of them things, you know. Yeah, man. School soon, if she not done start already a couple of years, me not see her far. Free me go and take care of your little sister. My heart is broken up with a couple blister. Show me talk with a strong persona. Them say me speak loud and out of order. Mind games them brother, mind games them brother. Yeah.